Hey everybody, it's Nick Weiss, the lead pastor of the Fervent Church, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's message, where we hope you're challenged, encouraged, and strengthened in your walk with Jesus today. If you have any questions about following Jesus or what the Bible means, please send your emails to connect at fervent.church, and we would love to answer those questions for you. Now, for more information about our ministry, visit us online at fervent.church, and remember, it's all so that people may know Jesus. All right, if you didn't bring a Bible, there are some back there, or they're going to be on the screen. Louis got them there, but we're going to just dive right into it. Okay, chapter 15, verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Again, now he's talking to the disciples, so giving you the context. He's been talking to the disciples, been talking about how he's going to give them the Holy Spirit, and then he goes into, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Now, one of the really significant things, if you're like a nerd about the Bible, the Bible is so cool, and the more you learn, the more you see like the poetic parts of the Bible come together. And it's really cool sometimes when you take a look at something with that 30,000 foot view of things, where you get to see different things make sense over time. Um, So I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. This is one of the I am statements. Has anyone ever heard of those before? I'll be honest, uh, until like recently, I knew the I am statements, but I didn't know anything like, oh, wow, that's an I am statement. I was like, so if you're like, no, well, that's fine. I didn't either. So an I am statement is like when Jesus specifically like is describing what he is specifically saying, I am this. Now, it wasn't until pretty recently that I kind of understood some of the significance of that. And it's actually because I've been studying a lot on Moses and the Israelites. And so this is why I want to bring that back, is because with Moses, thinking back, so before Jesus, if you guys ever seen the movie Prince of Egypt, anybody ever seen that movie? Great soundtrack, like all-star cast, yeah, you're like, some of you guys are like, no, well, you should watch it, because it's amazing, you'll thank me. Um, anyways, so Moses, he grew up, he was raised in the palace of Pharaoh, and because at that time, Egyptians were in charge over the Israelites, the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians, And the Egyptians saw that the Israelites were a lot in number, so they wanted to kill the babies, all the boy babies, because they said they can rise up against us. Well, if you don't know the story about Moses, Moses was left by the reeds and was found by Pharaoh's daughter, was raised in in the palace. I'm giving you the very brief synopsis version. Anyways, so he was raised, and at some point, this revelation happens with Moses, where he now flees because he realizes, like, he is not of the Egyptians. So he's in the desert. He's already killed an Egyptian, by the way, at this point, mind you. So he's already like very broken in the desert. And God speaks to Moses through the burning bush. And one of the things I want to bring up is this conversation. So God talking to Moses. You can turn there if you have your Bibles or it'll be on the screen. But Exodus 3, starting in verse 13, says this. Moses said to God, um, and this is, and to give, kept you up to speed, God wants Moses to go to Egypt to free his people because they've been enslaved. He says, I've heard their cries, go to Egypt and talk to them. And Moses is like, well, what am I going to tell them? Like, what do you mean? Like, and, and if the more you learn about Moses, Moses was not comfortable talking in public. That was something that he struggled with. That's something that Aaron helps him with later, his brother. But so he's like kind of questioning, like, what do I do? Like, what do you mean? How am I supposed to go to them? So Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. uh, The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Now, what I think is very unique as we go into this is that God is the I am. God is the I am. That's what he said. Tell the Israelites, I am who I am. Now, again, talking about that big picture of the Bible, talking about that big poetic part, in chapter 14, previously, so uh, one of the things that we've been learning is in John chapter 14, verses 8 through 11, Jesus answered, this is again the same conversation with the disciples. 
Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip, even if I am among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say, I am the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works of themselves. So these I am statements, we have Jesus saying, I am the Father, the Father is in me. Like you're getting a picture of the Trinity. And now what's confusing is, is you're talking about a very spiritual thing that sometimes is very hard to wrap your mind around. It is not... So the three are one and separate at the same time. And that is something that can be difficult to wrap your mind around. Jesus is Jesus the Son. God is God the Father and the Holy Spirit. But they are all three one and all three separate. <laughs> You're talking about a very spiritual thing, but here it is. That is the basis of the Trinity right there. And he says that if you see me, you have seen the Father. So what does that mean? Well, one, Jesus' life and ministry is a picture of God the Father. People will think like, okay, well, God's, you know, he's angry, he's crazy, he's doing all these things. Look at Jesus' life. If you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus, because that's, that's him. He loves you. He loves you so much. And did he get a little crazy? Yeah, look at the temple, because people were taking advantage of his people. Yeah, he does also have a wrath, but it is a righteous wrath. But he also has a love and a tenderness for the broken. And that is who the Father is. So when Jesus is making these I am statements, the beautiful poetic thing, as you go back to Exodus, the I am. Now you fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus, the I am. When it says I am, I'm like, oh, I'm paying attention because now this is a beautiful picture of who God the Father is in the flesh. And so I want to go over some of these I am statements with you. And as I did, like I said, I've been going through, uh, looking at the Israelites, going through uh, the life of Moses. And I found some really beautiful sim uh, similarities and pictures of these I am statements. Now, you may look at it and be like, well, Sam, this one fits better. That's great. I'm sure there is. But I'm just going to share with you what's been on my heart when I've been studying on it. So uh, the I am statements, one of the things that Jesus said, he said, I am the bread of life. That's John 6, verse 35. It says this, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So again, Jesus is the bread of life. This beautiful parallel that we see is the Israelites in the desert when they are hungry. Manna from heaven, they're hungry, and he gives them the bread. Now, fast forward. Jesus, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not go hungry, and whoever believes in me will not be thirsty. Because that's the other thing. They're like, oh, well, we're hungry. Well, now we're thirsty. He's like, well, hit the rock. Water's going to come out of it, right? He's giving you the parallels of like, listen, this is what you guys needed, and this is who I am. The I am the bread of life, that you will never be thirsty. Like, that is who he is. It says, uh, I am the good shepherd. John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know, knows me. God heard the cries of the Israelites and he sent Moses to them. God knows us. It says that he knows us so intricately. You see Jesus, too, he knowing the thoughts of people. We see that revealed through Scripture, knowing what the Pharisees were thinking. Again, a revelation that God knows us deeply, deeper deep than we know ourselves. The other thing is, and this is beautiful right here, the good shepherd, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The lamb's blood on the 10th plague was the Passover. And you had this, this last plague, it was, the, it was, hey, put the lamb's blood over the door, and death will pass over you. That's where we get the celebration of Passover from. Jesus' blood for us, death passes over us. Jesus is the perfect picture of what we are seeing in the Old Testament come into reality, into flesh. He gave his life for us. I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Now, this one, again, I'm, I'm really thinking a lot specifically about the Israelites here in the desert. Um, even though they die, and, and I'm actually going to pair this up with another one probably in a second. But when the Israelites were in the desert, they had a rebellious heart a couple of times, numerous times. Uh, you see that that's kind of the theme through there is they're faithful for a little bit. Then it's like, okay, Moses went up to the mountain. What happened? You guys have a gold calf. Like, what is going on? 
But the thing is, is at one point, they were rebellious, and there were these snakes that were biting them. And these snakes are equivalent. They're going to die. As soon as they got bit, it's like, okay, well, they're venomous snakes. You're going to die. But God also brought the solution, and that was looking to the pole. Literally, very simple. You look at this pole in the ground, and it's, this, it's where we get our medical symbol from, the pole with the snake on it, right? You look at that, and you'll be healed. He is the only way to the life, is Jesus. I'm going to speed up a little bit. I am the door, John 10, 7. Jesus therefore said, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Uh, I'm going to pair this up too. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. Again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, you have the snake. But the other thing that's interesting is, is when you had the face of destruction, you had the 10 plagues happen, and you had the uh, Egyptians chasing the Israelites, and they're at the base of the Red Sea. And here they are at the base of the Red Sea, and they're thinking like, oh my gosh, now what? We've got all these plagues, now we're at the base of the Red Sea, and I love, I love the Israelites because it is such a picture of us, and we are often way too critical of the Israelites, like how can they think that God's going to, come on, we know God's going to do something big here, and we get stuck in our problems, and we have our Red Sea, and we're like, God, where are you at? Like, where are you? It's like, have you forgotten everything else that he has done for us? Like, he just did all these 10 plagues. He's like, yeah, you're going to get through this, and it may not be how you look. I guarantee you they didn't think that, pe- that, that sea was going to part. But that was the only way. And the other thing that was interesting is the, the Egyptians tried to follow, and they were washed away. There is one way, and that was through the Father, and there is one way, and that is through Jesus. The other interesting thing is, Again, this is a, a less well-known fact, I guess. The Jordan River was how they entered into the Promised Land. When they crossed the Jordan River, there was one way. Again, it was in flood season. It was a time where it doesn't make sense. Jesus is the only way. Before Abraham I was, I am. John 8, 58. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I want to visit again that Exodus conversation with Moses. It says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. The I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord of, of uh, the Lord of the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. We have Jesus saying before Abraham was born, I am. This is something very significant. We think about it like, okay, like God, yeah, he's saying this. The, the Jewish people, for one, they held to the Bible. The only thing is, is their Bible didn't include of the New Testament. So when they look at it, they knew it, and they knew it very well. So for him to be making these statements would correlate with them, like, he's saying a really big thing here. Like, this is not just some ordinary guy. And we see that all throughout ministry of Jesus' life. Like, he, him telling him and revealing himself to them that he is and that he was existing before Abraham. We can do a whole study on that. We don't have time. We haven't even barely gotten into our text yet, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. I am the true vine. Here we are. Here we are today. I am the true vine. John 15, 1 through 2. I'll read this quickly. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, this is important, and I want to talk about this, is because he says he is the true vine. Jesus is a true vine. Now, this would be something that would correlate with them because one, Israel was covered in grapes. Grapes and vines were very common throughout Israel. It was something that would not be a foreign concept. We don't see grapes everywhere. So we think like, oh, grapes you get at the grocery store. You know, like I don't see a vineyard really. I mean, I guess you go to Fredericksburg or out there, you might. But it's something that would have been very easy for them to understand this imagery. So <clears throat> he says that he is the true vine and the father is the gardener. Israel had often been referred to as the vine. This is a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to read this to you because it's just so good. Psalm 80. It's the people of Judah calling out. So at this point, they had been exiled, and now they're at a point of like, you read uh, through uh, Psalm 80, it's like their cry for help. Like, hey, send us some saving here because we want, like, what's going on? So it says... uh, to the tune of the lilies of the covenant. <laughs> it says, hear us, shepherd of Israel. Again, who is a shepherd? 
the good shepherd is Jesus. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, who lead Joseph like a flock, who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God mighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. Again, talking about the Israels. Israelites leaving Egypt and uh, drove out the nations and planted it. Again, the clearing of the promised land and that they had a place in the promised land. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with shade and the mighty cedars and its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea. It shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass pick its grapes? One thing I want to pause on real quick is the Israelites rebelled against Jesus in the promised land. And so there was a prophet, Jeremiah, who came and was like, listen, guys, we need to fix what we're doing and turn back to God. Jeremiah was considered the lamenting prophet. It was, he would give these prophecies with tears. The interesting thing about Jeremiah is he had no converts. Because here's the thing. He brought these prophecies to the Israelites. The Israelites had false prophets. And they came and said, that's not going to happen. Because Jeremiah had a prophecy that, hey, some bad things are going to happen. We're going to be help taken captive. People are going to die. The, it talked about some crazy stuff. It talked about the baby's head smashed on the stone. And it said he saw these things and his eyes were filled with tears because of the things to come. And he's like, we need to turn back to God. And these false prophets were like, no, we're good. Well, everything that Jeremiah said came to pass. And so now we are. These, the Israelites have been enslaved uh, they're, 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 now they're asking in this prayer, why have you broken down its walls so that all pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it and the insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down on heaven and see. Watch over this vine. Pay attention to this. Watch over this vine. The root of your right hand has planted. The sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us. We will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us. That way we may be saved. God already had the solution, by the way, in the works. Jesus, at the, at the fall of man uh, with Adam and Eve, Jesus was prophesied that there was already saving coming as soon as it was needed. But here the Israelites are, they had turned from God, and they are saying, like, how long? The things that I think are just so interesting, watch over this vine. Again, referring to the Israelites, talking about the Israelites, root your hand that it has planted, and they're asking for a savior. And look at how they ask. It says, give us this, we will not turn away from you, revive us, and we will call on your name. Jesus was going to be the answer to more than what they could even ask or imagine. What God was giving them was way deeper than just like, yeah, you're going to get to live in this land again. It was something so much deeper. You're going to get to be with me forever. I have the solution to something that is more deeper than what you're even asking. You can't even understand. And it says, Re revive us, restore us, Lord Almighty, that your face may be shined upon us, that we may be saved. Asking for that. Now, Going back to verse 1, Jesus starts with saying, I am the true vine. Hey, guess what? Israel, you're not the vine. I am the true vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. That's so deep, because for one, that would have been a cultural shakeup to what they've believed. Jesus is coming in, rocking the boat like, listen, I'm the true vine. I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. We're going to talk more about the gardener and God being the gardener later. Uh, let's go to verse 2. It says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. We talk about fruit. We're not talking about apples and oranges. You're like, oh, well, there was a lot of cultivation happening out there. Yeah, but specifically what we're talking about we see referred to as the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So again, Jesus being the vine, every branch that does not bear fruit. When we have Jesus and you are abiding in Jesus, you will start to bear fruit. And that is what it's saying. It says the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, being loving, joyful, peace, forbearance. Now, again, it doesn't mean that you're not going to mess up. I want to be very clear. It's going to be like, well, that wasn't very loving. I don't have the fruit in me right now. Listen, you messed up. We're going to talk about that in a second. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. It says, but it, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in Jesus. We're not going to be perfect, but there is a difference between knowing that Jesus is the Messiah and accepting Jesus as your Messiah. There is a difference in that. Because even Satan and his angels know who Jesus is. But he's not their Messiah. So could you intellectually know that Jesus died for your sins on the cross? Yeah, you could. But there's a difference between knowing that and accepting that. It's there for you. It's looking at the pole. It's as simple. I can know. Yeah, I could look at the pole. I just got bit by the snake. I can look at the pole and be saved. That's different than actually looking at the pole. Knowing it and doing it are two different things. And this is what we're, more what we're talking about, is because when we have Jesus, you won't stay the same. You may not be perfect, and we won't. We're not perfect. We're not ever going to be perfect until we're done here. But your life will look different. And that's what we're going to talk about is God the, is the gardener. And it may not be immediately like, yeah, I just am done with everything. Everything's gone. Sometimes, it's, guess what? It's a struggle, and I'm going to give you some encouragement and maybe some discouragement. It's going to always be a struggle because we live in a world that's broken, and we are flawed. All of us, all of us, we are flawed. And if you think, well, the struggle will one day stop, guess what? There are seasons where struggles subside, but I'm going to encourage you and discourage you at the same time. Another one will come. <laughs> Another struggle will come. Why? Because we have an enemy seeking to destroy us. Seeking to destroy us. And guess what? I, there, Brandon Cormier was a pastor we heard back in Tucson. He gave something to me that, or said something that has always stuck with me. Discouragement is the devil's decision that you matter. Sometimes that discouragement is not trying to do something like, well, I don't know enough about the Bible, so I'm not going to tell them that. Or I don't know. I don't know them well enough. I don't want to pray for them. Or like, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to go to church. I messed up this week. No. If anything, at the feet of Jesus is where we should always be. Because... We are deserve nothing else. We're going to talk more about that here in a little bit. But love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We won't be the same. But Jesus is rebuking. Uh, when Jesus was, was talking about the bush that bared no fruit, and this is a whole other study. But he looked at the fig tree, bared no fruit. He cursed it, and it withered. Uh, talking about the lukewarm, it says that he will spew you from your mouth. So, like, listen, like, hey, let's say you're like, yeah, I'm living for Jesus, I love Jesus, but your life looks nothing like it. I would say that's a dangerous spot to be in because it's like, listen, you can know that Jesus is the Messiah, but have you accepted him in living that? I'm not here to judge that. I'm just saying this is a self-check is what this is. We're going to talk more about that. This is an inward check on our own hearts, not me saying, are you doing this? Because that's wrong. No, listen, there is a, something to be said about accountability, and we're going to talk about that. There's also something to be said about warring and godly wisdom. But ultimately, the one at the end of the day that knows where you are at is you and the Lord. Because you can have someone that looks like they have it all together, and they can be far from it. So that's my encouragement to you, is this is a self-check. Um, but it is very clear. It says, he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Now, what does that mean? Again, it means we're not perfect. When you look at a grape vineyard, you have the grapes. They need pruning in order to grow. Let me tell you what pruning is. It's, I looked it up. It says, pruning is an opportunity to control vine damage and disease early on to ensure that the grapes have enough air circulation to prevent mildew and rot. Let me read that to you one more time. This is what God is doing to us, God the Father, the gardener. It's an opportunity to control vine damage and disease early on and ensure that the grapes have enough air and circulation to prevent mildew and rot. When you give your life to Jesus, you give it all. And guess what? That means the things that need to be pruned. And he will prune that. You abide in Jesus, the Father is going to prune those things out of you that are the things that are controlling the vine damage. And even as you grow and even as you've been walking with Jesus a long time, guess what? You need pruning. Why? Because if you start to let those things 
grow that are going to kill the fruit, that's going to start to kill the fruit. And that's where God comes in and is like, hey, we need to prune that. That's why when you get that, oh, man, like I messed up, uh, that conviction, that rebuke, it's like it's a way of us staying humble of like I don't have it together. If you ever have someone that says they have it all together, the Bible talks specifically about that. They're a liar. <laughs> so that's the thing is having that humility of like, one, recognizing that I'm flawed. Two, also not being like, yeah, I'm flawed. I'll just keep doing it because I'm flawed. There's a difference in that. There's grace, but also we don't want to abuse grace. It says the pruning that happens, God cleans us out. He redirects us so that we can grow and that we can have fruit. It's surrendering it to him, though. If we don't do that, those nutrients that are supposed to go to that fruit, where do they go? They go to the things that are going to cause death to that plant, death to those vines, death to the, to the grapes. Chapter, or verse 3 and 4, we're going we're gonna to keep pushing here. Verse 3. It says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Again, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. He is the vine. He is the true vine. Here's the thing is the vine is the source to growth. Those fruits, the grapes, They don't grow without the vine. Otherwise, they become a raisin, and nobody likes those. We don't want raisins. But the thing is, the the vine is what gives that fruit life. The vine is the center of the grape, not an accessory. Jesus is the center, not an accessory. What does that mean? That means Jesus is not a box on Sunday morning that we check, and we say, okay, Jesus, well, that was great. Thank you for speaking to me. I'll listen to a worship song in the morning and I'll have that Monday morning faith and then I'll see you next Sunday. No, Jesus is involved in everything, the center of something. Those grapes are attached to the vine. Those grapes are in the vine. And that is what Jesus wants. He wants us abiding in him. He wants us in him, not just on Sunday, not just whatever, in everything, at your work, with your kids, wherever. I mean, fill in the blank. And here's the thing is, is it is easy to slip into seasons of busy. And I have five kids. I know that. It is easy. And it's not always a direct decision of like, yeah, well, I'm going to walk away. No. Sometimes it's just not being intentional. And that is what I received from the conference this last week is we have a lot going on. And it is, you know, you have your time with your kids. You have your time with God. But it's being intentional in the sense of like, we get to sit at the feet of Jesus. And ultimately, that's what he wants, is just to be abiding in him. We're going to talk more about that here in a bit. John 15, verse 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, and I in you. You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, this is talking about of like eternal significance. Apart from Jesus, we aren't doing anything. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9 says this. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants, the one who waters uh, have, have one purpose and they will teach each other to be, or they will each be recorded to their own labor for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Here's the thing. Apart from Jesus, are we planting seeds or watering? It, it, ultimately what it's saying is if you don't have Jesus, We're not doing anything. Jesus is the reason we are planting. Sometimes we see our seeds grow. What I mean by that is as we go out, as you live your life, we are called to be a light in the world. I'll put this very simply. We're called to be a light. What that means is, again, as you bear fruit, your life should look different than others. As you walk with Jesus, your life should look different than others. A response at work, just to give you very practical things. Sometimes it's very easy to get frustrated. Something where you could maybe be really justified to be really frustrated by. Instead of that, like, I'm going to be gracious. I'm just going to be gracious. I can tell you that. That is going to be, and this is something that I sometimes struggle with as well. So I'm not saying this like, yeah, you guys, you know, I'll be gracious. Listen, it's hard. Walking with Jesus is hard. And it is a daily thing. And sometimes, like, literally, you'll go from a sermon, you'll go to lunch, and you'll be like, this waitress is taking forever. What is going on? And you're like, oh, my gosh. Literally, I just slipped back into it. It's not always this big, giant pit fall hold of sin. Sometimes it's just walking in everyday things. And it may be. It may be the, the, the stronghold of a sin. If that's the case, I pray for you on that. 
But a lot of it, too, is just walking with him daily in the everyday things, in the mundane things. He wants to be in all of it. He wants to be in it. He wants to be involved. It says, apart from Jesus, how are we planting? God is the gardener. Let's be very clear on something. God is not lucky to have us. He's not lucky to have us. We are lucky to have Jesus. Because I think sometimes we can think like, well, you know, I'm really gifted at that. I should be doing that. Or man, they said that. I could have been doing that way better than they did. Like, are this person's like on social media? I have so much more wisdom than they do. People should listen to me more. <laughs> you know, listen, first of all, we got a couple things to talk about about that. But God is the one. God is the gardener. He is not lucky to have us. He's gracious to use us. We are lucky to have Jesus because apart from him, we are nothing. The Bible talks about that our most righteous self is like filthy rags in the presence of the king, that we are nothing. We are just dirty filth that he chooses to use. Similarly, though, I want to also encourage you, if you're the person that struggles with like, I'm not enough, I'm this, that, let me encourage you, you're not. But guess what? Jesus is. Because we are to bring what we have to the Lord and watch him work. We're to bring what we have and watch him work. Just like the little boy, when all those people were hungry with the 5,000 men and their families, and all the disciples are like, this will take more than a year's wages to feed these people, thinking inwardly, like, how are we going to do this? And here's a little boy. I can just see it now. I can just see, like, one of my kids, like, I got my food. You want some? And they're like, thanks, kid. And Jesus is like, let me work. You bring what you have and watch me work. That's what he wants. He just wants what you have. He just wants you and watch him work. He's the one that's doing it. When we remove ourselves from the situation, you're going to see some things happen because why? It's not you anymore. It's Jesus. And that's the thing is that's where the glory belongs anyways. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 says this. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high the deep uh, of the love of Christ and to know that his love surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled with the measure and all of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do a measure even more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation forever and ever. Amen. That Jesus can do more than you can even imagine if you just get out of your own way. Similarly so, he doesn't need you get out of your own way and let him work. Because as soon as we start to think that we are more than we are, that's dangerous. We need to have humility, but also confidence. Humility, but confidence, because we have the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus had just been talking about to the disciples. John 15, verse 6, we're going to keep going here. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. This is a really hot topic um, for, like, Bible studies. It's one where people love to sit and they love to debate and they love to get theological on. If that's what you're looking for, I'm going to disappoint you. But I am going to tell you this. There's a lot of fancy words, essentially, that are saying an argument for can someone lose their salvation or were they never saved? There's fancy words. I don't even know how to pronounce them, so I'm not going to try it's this mentality it's talking about here. Let's read it again. It says, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. It's giving you that representation of hell and death. So it says, If you don't remain in me, this is what's going to happen. Well, some people want to take that and be like, Okay, well, they were never saved to begin with. Or, Well, they lost their salvation. Let me, let me first start with, with this. Read the first section of that. Let's read it together. If you do not remain in me, the first thing is this is a self-evaluation, not an other evaluation. If it doesn't say it's talking about someone else, it's talking about you. This is an inward check. So let's start there. Let's look inwardly. When you go on the plane and the flight attendant, we were just on one, and half the time I put the headphones on because they say the same thing. But get on the plane, what do they say? They say, if, if 
we have emergency, oxygen mask, put yours on first, then put on the person next to you. Why? Because you can't help the next person next to you if you're unconscious. That's why Jesus also was like, don't focus on the speck in your brother's eye and ignore the log in yours. This should always be an inward check first. Inward check first. If you do not remain in me, if we are not inviting in Jesus, there's a very simple solution to this. Abide in Jesus. It's, it's simple. It's not how far is the line and how far can I go? The answer is clear. Abide in Jesus. Jesus is the answer. People want to talk about it, though. They want to ask. And, and my answer to it is, honestly, I don't think it matters because there's a solution. And the solution is this. Either way, Whatever you believe, whether someone can lose their salvation or they were never saved, you have work to do as a believer. So it doesn't matter the problem, you need the solution. And the solution is still Jesus. People like to talk about it. People like to sit over campfires like, well, you know, in this verse, it says this. Listen, ultimately, does it matter whether someone lost their salvation or was never saved? You still have someone that needs Jesus. And so your solution is, is, is to pray for them. One, it's either be a light and share the gospel because they never heard it. Or two, this person was lost and we should be praying for them to come back to Jesus. The solution is clear. And that's where I kind of stand on that. Either way you lean, you have a job to do. Instead of worrying about what the problem is, worry about what the solution is. And that's kind of where I go with that. Uh, John 15, verse 7. It says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. Um, There is actually one thing I just want to say real quick, though, going back to verse 6. And I don't want to skate over this too much. That warning, though, is a very real warning. And that is an inward warning to us and something that we need to be attentive of as well. Um, we need to pay attention to that warning while still being in prayers for the lost. Uh, I'm going to keep going, though. Sorry, I, I forgot that. Uh, John 15, verse 7 says, again, we'll, we'll start over. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. Uh, done for you. This is the Father, or this is to my Father's glory that you will bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Um, we went to uh, this conference, and if you know Ed Taylor, Ed Taylor spoke, and there's something in here as I was reading that just reminded me of what what he said. It says, "If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you." People love to take that out of context as well. People love to say that whole name it and claim it thing, like you do this, God's going to give you all these things. We're going to talk about that um, because one thing I just thought was beautiful is can Jesus and can God give you anything? They can. But also there's a way to be asking, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, but I want to give you this story first. Ed Taylor, a pastor, he was a pastor of Aurora. He goes through and he's talking and he says, you know, um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, social media is dangerous. It's dangerous when you're a church planner. It's dangerous when you've been a pastor for however many years because comparison is a very real thing. And sometimes you can't help but to be like, oh man, I'm getting jealous by that. So he said, so I, I you know, and, and just to give you a, an idea, he has a pretty large church. Um, and he says that he saw one of his pastor friends that some people came from like Saudi Arabia and they came to his church all the way from Saudi Arabia because they wanted to hear him speak. He's like, man, that's just so cool. Like, I wish that someone would want to just be here and, and just, that's just so cool, right? And so he's like, okay, you know, he's going through and he's like, that'd just be awesome. He says, well, fast forward and a couple from Vietnam comes and he's like, oh man, that was just awesome. Like this couple, they said, hey, we've been watching you uh, online in our home in Vietnam and you've been pastoring us for years and like, it's just, you've been speaking into our life and he's like, man, how crazy. Like I asked God, he gave it to me. And he says, he's driving home and he's just like, man, like how cool. And he's like, he had this conversation with God. He's like, well, what else do you want? He's like, yeah, well, you know, I want this relationship with my grandkids. I want this. And he says, and God, he's like this whole time. He's like, yeah, God can do that. God can do that. And he said that as he was getting home from this like 20 minute drive, that he had this revelation of like, when are you going to ask for me? When are you going to ask for me? Because I can do all of those things, sure, but when is your heart going to be just on me? 
And it's like God can do a lot of things, but when we, we're told, one, by Jesus how to enter in his presence and how to come into asking for things. One, in the uh, Lord's Prayer, which we're going through, it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How often are we asking for God's will versus our own? A lot of our requests are, God, I need this. God, I want this. God, this needs to happen. And if sometimes we would step out of our own way and watch God open the doors, it can be pretty crazy. Please don't take this as like a holier than thou thing, but I can tell you this. I never once in a million years thought I'd be in Hutto. I never once in a million years thought I wouldn't be still a cop in Tucson. But just having a heart, and again, not to be like, oh, well, yeah, I'm really open to the Holy Spirit. Listen, I still struggle with that. It's just being open to it. But at the same day, when you get out of your own way and just let the Lord work and your will is just, God, what do you want? Get ready, one, for because you're going to go on a ride. Because you're going to be like, how did we get here? How did I end up in Hutto, Texas, working at a construction company? Never would have thought that was going to happen. But if you just ask for God's will. 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 14 says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we have what we have asked him. The thing is, is when your will is impaired to God's will, you're going to want what he wants for you. Because then it's going to be, God, what do you want for me? Because I want what you want. God, if you want this for me, give it to me. But if you don't, close that door. Because I don't want to walk through a door that you're not behind. And that's the thing is, he will give you your requests. But also, too, be careful, because sometimes we get dangerous of kicking our own doors down and going down our own path. But also, too, that's why he wants to save us from that destruction by remaining in his will. We should be seeking to mirror his. Uh, I'm going to close with this as, as we're, we're wrapping up. Is Ultimately, if you have anything, the simple answer is remain in Jesus. Remain in Jesus. Abide in Jesus. Have him be the vine of your life, not just the accessory. The grape grows from the vine so that people may know Jesus. Jesus has... Uh, referred to the figs. Fig trees are, has anyone ever seen a fig tree, by the way? A couple of us, I had not, but uh, maybe there's some arborists in here. Uh, if you look at a fig tree and you look at the fruit in the fig tree, you think about the, 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 the actual fruit itself. What's going on internally, the fruit, let's just imagine that fruit had eyes, right? It can only see everything exterior. Lou, do you have the picture of the fruit? Can you pull that up? I'm going to show you a picture of a, of a fig. This is the inside of the fig right here. These are seeds. When you let the Lord work in your heart and you let that fruit grow, Jesus is going to get a return. And it's not because of anything that you're doing. You're not making this grow. Your only job is to stay attached to the vine. That's it. He's going to grow everything else in you, and he's going to get his return in that. But our ultimate goal is we need to stay in Jesus through the easy, through the hard, through the busy, whatever it may be, abiding in him because that's what we've been told to do. I want to close, but I want to close with this, is giving you a time, one, it may not even be something big or crazy or, or whatever, it, sometimes it's just busy, is centering back on Jesus being your vine because it can be really easy to slip back into that season of just going through the motions. Yep, God, I read the verse of the day today, did that, read my Bible, sang an SEU song, and everyone loves SEU, uh, so sang a worship song, and now I'm going to go through my day. It's abiding in Jesus, and what does that look like? That means inviting him to every part of your day. Hey, I'm going to the store. You know what? I want to be a light at the store. Being intentional, and the more you do that, the more you think about it, watch, because God will open up doors and opportunities for you to be a light and for you to love others. And it ultimately is not you, it's Jesus. But let's pray. And if you need that time to just be like, God, you know, I've been busy or God, I've been, maybe I've been the, the bush that's not having any fruit. Maybe that's the case. Like, I want to encourage you, don't leave this place without making that decision to make it right for you today. Uh, but dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we know it just lives in us, Lord. We pray that we can be a light. We pray that we can just bear fruit, Lord, for your glory so that others may know you. Because that is why we are here, so that others may know you. Lord, I pray that you just help us to abide in you in the good, in the bad, in the hard, in the busy, in whatever, Lord. We pray that we will just stay in your vine, Lord. We just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.